hello everybody. Uh, I'm Phil Morgan. Um, Bill Mason has asked me to step in because he suffered a family bereavement and he sadly cannot be with us today. Um, today our guest speaker is Danny Older. Uh, Danny is an independent ecologist with a range of plants specializing in restoration ecology and habitat management. He's previously worked as a ranger and senior ecologist for Dorset County Council for 16 years. While at the council, he started his PhD at the School of Science and Environment uh, at Manchester Metropolitan University, looking at woodland bird populations, which have undergone long-term decline associated with changes in woodland structure. Uh, the field work for his PhD was carried out at the Rushmore Estate at Tollard Royal on Cranbourne Chase, uh, a beautiful part of the world and a place with a rich history of land management and landscape heritage uh, that has led to the formation of rare and fascinating habitats. There's also a recent history of irregular high forest management on a cluster of estates on the Chase providing a range of different stand types in transformation with good examples of early successional understory and canopy vegetation. This with the rich heritage of traditional coppice woodlands in the area has provided a valuable place for his research. Danny will present his talk, highlighting his study methods and discussing the implications of his research. This is a great opportunity to understand how ecology and forest management can interact and serve each other. I'm very much looking forward to it. Danny, over to you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Phil, and um, good afternoon, everybody. I'll just get to share my screen with you. All right, can you see, everybody see that, I hope? Yes, that's great. Right, okay, um, right. Um, well, thanks for the introduction, Phil. Yes, the PhD was undertaken um, whoops, there we go, on the Rushmore Estate on the Dorset Wiltshire border. It sits within the Cranbourne Chase AOMB, or now the uh, National Landscapes, as they're called, um, pretty much in the middle of the green area that you can see in the map below. Um, there's a nice panoramic um, view of... Um, of the chase woods which are on the uh what's so called wooded chalk downland of uh, of the landscape character area um steeped in in history as um uh, as phil has already alluded um was the uh the residence of augustus pitt rivers who was one of the leading lights in modern day archaeology in the victorian period and even today it's still a very important um area for archaeological investigation in fact um Recently, some studies were undertaken which um, identified that during the Mesolithic period, it was likely that the woodland cover here was was much less than other parts of central southern England, which uh, perhaps the um, ancients were practicing irregular silver culture then. We just don't know about it. Um, as, as Phil has mentioned, it was a, uh, an important um, uh, part of the uh, cop area for the coppice industry. Um, and today there is still uh, one, at least one full time hurdle maker operating uh, in the Chase Woods. Um, you can see the rather fetching chappy on the left hand side with his um, armoured gown and uh, his cutlass and staff and helmet. And he was a, a would have been a forest keeper uh, that was employed by the um, uh, by the forest uh, court to uh, keep uh, people under control and stop poaching and stop people from damaging the uh, the vert or the wood, wooded areas. Um, so my my research um, today, I'm going to talk about the, um, uh, well, primarily I'm going to talk about woodland structure a lot. It, it features heavily in my PhD and the three papers that have been published on, on birds, uh, plants and, and bats. Um, I'm going to look at... Um, Talk a bit about the abundances and richnesses of, of those um, groups uh, and the differences and similarities across the uh, different stand management types that we um, we looked at. When I say we, I mean, I did a lot of the field work, but it, it wasn't all by I didn't do it all by myself. There are a lot of people who gave uh, a good deal of support and technical input into this. Um, and I'll talk about them later on. Um, so there were four main stand management types and this is all within the ancient semi-natural woodland all in broadleaf woodland 
Um, and if we start at the top left with the limited intervention stands, and these were stands which had not been subject to any kind of regular or formal silvicultural operations for at least 25 years. By and large, they've been neglected um, and often for, for a good deal longer than that. Um, coppice, and here you can see a, a, a hazel coppice stand just prior to it being cut as it was the following winter. Um, but there's also um, um, simple um, coppice as well with um, stands of pure birch. Um, and then the bottom right, you can see the transitional stands, um, which are stands which are about to be um, transformed towards an irregular high forest, but they're in the very early stages. And I hope this I get this right because Andy Paul will be on to me to let me know if not. Um, and this particular um, Oops, I do apologise. This particular um, um, stand shows even aged um, ash, uh, which has just been marked up for uh, first intervention. And then bottom left is the um, uh, typical sort of irregular stand, the, the ideal irregular stand, which is sort of rather multi-dimensional, plenty of understory, patchy, open canopy uh, and a mixture of different age classes. And that table just shows the relative proportions of the area. So it was over 400 hectares. Um, and uh, uh, for the for the level one sampling that we did, there were 310 plots, um, which were across this this area that you can see. Tolleroyal is the is the village, which is sort of more or less in the centre there. Um, and you have the Chase Wood, which is the large block of woodland that you can see going on to the upper right hand side. The four stand types are signified by uh, the yellow is the limited intervention stands. Um, the, the blue is uh, the transitional stands. Red is the regular and the orange um, edge stands are the, are the coppice stands. So they were quite nicely mixed up across mm -hmm. the estate. Um, so the phase one was for all, all the habitat structural measures were, were taken at the 310 sample points that you can see here. And then phase two, we, we homed in on 120 plots to look at in more detail at bats, moths, um, higher plants, as, as, as well as birds. Um, it would have been nice to have done 310 plots for all of these groups, but it, it just wasn't wasn't physically possible to do that, to lug around a light trap and to take around all the bat detectors and, and, and so on. Uh, but nonetheless, um, we, we were able to select 40 of the best examples of coppice, irregular uh, and limited intervention to carry out studies on those groups. This is a, a, a typical sort of plot layout. So plots were put out on a grid um, a minimum of 100 metres apart. Um, I think the average is about 100 and 120 metres apart. Uh, and each plot um, would be um, described on, on a 30 metre diameter within which all of the measures were taken. You can see the five little circles in there, they're three metre diameter subplots uh, in which we, we took other measures. So, um, for example, across the wider plots, we would have uh, collected um, uh, the, the, the larger, larger diameter stems, so total stem count for bigger trees in three or four eight, uh, different classes. Um, but for the smaller plots, and they were where we, we, would, we would count the, um, the stems for things like um, you know, recently cut coppice. So anything that was below about seven and a half centimetre DBH would be counted in, in those subplots. Mm -hmm. um, and the um, um, understory density measures were also collected in, in those five subplots. Um, along um, along with um, canopy openers. That was a quadrat that was used by Brian Edwards, who's a, a, a botanist from Dorset Environmental Records Centre who helped collect the plant data. So I'll just talk a little bit more about structural um, measures that we collected or I collected um, with with some help. Um, the the understory density was was uh, sampled using a checkerboard method at um, three different height bands. Um, and this was a checkerboard that was made up by my colleagues in the sign shop at Dorset County Council. Um, and it's a way of measuring the vegetation obscuration, uh, which gives a, a, an ind index of um, relative density of understory vegetation at different heights. 
So you can just see see that in in the in three of those um, four photographs there. Um, then the the bottom right photo shows a, a spherical densiometer, which is a, a basically a mirror, a concave mirror, sorry, a convex mirror that's used to make an estimate of the um, amount of canopy openness, or or indeed you could you could choose canopy closure, um, and in fact it's got little instruction uh, label which comes with it, so um, you can you can work out um, a percentage cover or, or a ca canopy openness. So. As I mentioned, there were stem densities per plot in five diameter classes. Um, we also counted, or I also counted the um, uh, frequency of deadwood snags that were over 20 centimeters diameter. Um, basal area, um, which is obviously a language which many of you will be familiar with, as well as the canopy opens and understory measures. Um, birds were counted using um, morning point counts uh, five minutes at five minutes at each plot so that was very early in the morning just after the the main sort of period of dawn chorus because it's quite overwhelming trying to count birds when they're really going for it um there were two counts um in the spring one to capture the resident birds and uh, again later on in the in the spring to capture the migratory species that arrive slightly later so birds like willow warbler and um, spotted flycatcher for example and then there was a, a another count for birds uh, in late winter so we could we could see what was going on in in uh, different times of the year um, I used density um, software called distance which produces an estimate of the numbers of birds uh, per square kilometer, or could do it. Um, you can do it for um, square um, um, hectare for a hectares or for a tract, um, and it's stratified for each stand type. Um, and we added in the understory density measures as a covariate because obviously that influences the detection um, capability. In, in particularly if you're in that very dense woodland, I have to say when you're counting birds in 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 woods, you are reliant on um, oral detection rather than visual detection a lot of the time. Nevertheless, I used a, a laser rangefinder to try and get an exact distance measure, which you then um, add into the um, into the analysis as well to generate the density estimates. Um, so we then I then used um, um, once we'd done all of the analysis on the um, uh, distance sampling, we then put the uh, relative positions of the birds into a, a community analysis alongside the structural measures. So we could see how they related to, to one another. And we use multiple uh, comparison tests across the four stand management types to compare the structures um, and also compare the, um, the individual species as well. Um, you might be interested in this. This is a, a, a smartphone app called Motti. It's produced by um, uh, Swiss Forest Research. Um, and that was very, very useful for uh, collecting basal area. This is the first um, um, big table, which I'm not expecting you to read all of this. Um, you might be interested to know that there is a, a there is a summary article coming out in um, in the Quarterly Journal of Forestry. And I think it's imminent um, any time in the next uh, few weeks, uh, which will summarise quite nicely the presentation that I'm giving now. And this table is in there with a much more detailed explanation than I can give you today. But um, you can see that there were some significant differences across the four stand management types and probably not surprising to many of you, really, that um, the more neglected limited intervention stands had the higher basal area. Um, and transition was next, um, followed by irregular and coppice with very similar um, um, amounts as well. So they, these are averages. Um, I haven't put the standard deviation measures in this particular table just to make it a bit less, uh, a less fussy looking. Um, irregular was was cat was um, was sort of um, mu much more open, um, and surprisingly so than, than coppice. But I think it reflects really the the sampling being done in coppice which had you know established itself regrown and was probably you know two or three meters high and that effectively was closing the canopy um but that's so so that's quite quite interesting about um 15 20 percent of the coppice had, had only just been cut uh and there were various um stages of of uh, of the coppice cycle represented in the um data collection um so larger trees were, you know, irregular silviculture was signified by some of the larger trees, and that accounts for 
mean DBH as well. Um, and interestingly, the deadwood snag count in uh, irregular was was highest as well. Um, the letters next to the numbers represent the stand against which there was a statistically significant difference. Um, just just in case you were wondering what they were for. Um, but um, understory density in irregular was was highest and significantly so um, compared to um, uh, limited and transitional stands. And, um, and, and possibly that's related to the amount of bramble cover as well, which is quite high in, in, in irregular. And that may be a, a down to site type, deeper soils, or just once that canopy is opened up, bramble is one of those species that, that responds quite, um, quite dramatically. Um, unsurprisingly, bare ground percentage is um, is the highest in limited intervention stands. Um, you might be surprised by the the lack of dead wood snags in the limited intervention stands. And one of the habitat variables which aren't in, shown in this table is the amount of fallen dead wood. Uh, and and fallen dead wood was highest in limited intervention. I think what that signifies is that a lot of stems were fighting for light, they were dying off and then falling over. Whereas in irregular, obviously it's been managed for I think three or four decades now. Um, you have well-developed stands there and uh, the deadwood snags, you know, obviously some retention of deadwood is um is um, is desirable and that's certainly what um, what Andy has has achieved there at um, at Rushville. Um right so the birds count data we we had um Nearly 5,000 individual birds were were registered during those um, counts. Um, 38 different species, 14 specialists, and these are woodland specialists, birds which find all of their resources in woodland. So um, they, they find their nest sites, their foraging areas, predominantly within woodland. So birds like the marsh tit that you can see there, which is one of those um, birds of conservation concern as well. And then there were some uh, 10 generalists and 14 non-woodland species. So I'm afraid this is another rather you know, text heavy table, um, but I've highlighted um, the columns on the left show the spring densities um, and the columns on the right are the winter densities of um, each of the species that we're able to run through the distance sampling analysis to generate these density estimates. Um, so you can see that actually there's quite a few um, a high number of, um, of, of birds with the highest densities found in, in the irregular. Perhaps unsurprisingly, birds such as willow warbler and garden warbler uh, and chiff chaff, uh, birds which like this early successional scrub, are associated most strongly with, with the coppice. But nonetheless, um, you know, uh, significantly... Um, uh, importantly so in, in irregular too for, for a few of those understory species. Whereas things like great spotted woodpecker, um, nuthatch and tree creeper were found in, in quite high densities, in highest densities in the irregular stands. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, the limited intervention stands uh, were, were not doing so well, with, only with birds like wood pigeon, uh, which is a generalist um, mm -hmm. bird, and um, uh, and uh, Great it um, again, which is uh, more of a generalist species. Things things changed uh, uh, quite a lot later on um, in the at the end of the winter, and birds were moving around much more um, um, fluidly, probably because they form these very large flocks and uh, and move around. Um, uh, but what was quite interesting is that if you look at some of the um, the density measures for say for example blue tit and great tit they have very very high numbers higher than they were in the um uh, in this and that's probably because birds were coming in were drawn into the woodland from the wider countryside okay so just a quick summary um of the significant variation in the vegetation measures i mean the regular was characterized by fewer bigger trees an uneven mix of ages with a developing understory um, spring bird densities were highest in irregular for half of the 20 species and winter, winter densities were uh, closer between stands but limited intervention had six species with highest, abund highest abundances and regular five. Um, 
certainly limited intervention had the lowest or second lowest spring densities of 14 20 from 14 of 20 species due to probably lack of understory um three of the four warblers were highest densities in coppice but second in irregular which i've already mentioned um and in winter no species had their highest densities in in the coppice uh, i think that's because they were just moving around so much more and um, as I mentioned earlier, these woodland specialists were much more associated with um, irregular high forest. Um, and the summer density for marsh tit, which is I didn't really talk very much about, was um, was around twice that found in any of the other management types and, and does suggest huge potential for this particular species. It's a bird which has declined by more than 70 percent since 1970. Um, work that's been done on this species by uh, Richard Broughton at CEA suggests that they're a bird that like understory in association with, with canopy, where they can preferentially forage away from their main competitors, which are blue and, and great tits. Right, I'm going to just talk briefly about um, about bats. Um, I did a, we did the study of 100 uh, for 120 plots for bats, um, as well as for plants, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. Um, using uh, using acoustic um, sampling, and this is one of the detectors you can see on the um, on the screen there uh, with a microphone. Um, so there were two sampling periods uh, with a three week um, interval in between uh, in the summertime to sort of coincide with the the peak of the uh, bat activity season towards the end of June, July, and again end of July through to the beginning of September. Um, sampling was was undertaken using six of these units but sampling evenly so that we could make a, a fair comparison across the three stand types of irregular um, coppice and limited intervention. Um, produces a, a lot of data as you can imagine um, when um, go, trying to go through this manually it takes a long time so we used um, some software which has been produced by uh, Dr. Stuart Newson, who's a, an ecologist, works for the British Trust for Ornithology and is probably one of the country's leading experts on bioacoustics. I was very lucky to have Stuart uh, giving us his um, his advice on, on the study design and doing a lot of the uh, analysis of the calls for us. Nevertheless, it was a two-step process and I did actually check through um, most of the... Um, the data. Um, so this software is called Tadareda, which is the Latin name of, one, of a bat species, which we don't find in the UK. Um, it's a European species. Um, and that classified 123,000 files. Uh, so uh, we use bat passes as as the, the sort of the metric, really, as a, as a proxy for um, bat abundance or bat activity, really, um, of which it said 46,000 were bats. After manual checking, um, we got down to 35,230. And by far the commonest species um, you'll probably spot there is, uh, is pipistrelle, common pipistrelle, uh, with 78% of the, um, of the uh, calls um, identified to that species, followed by, unsurprisingly, soprano pipistrelle, um, which is 8.1%. What was very pleasing to see was that um, Western Barbastel, which is one of the IUCN um, red listed species internationally it's um, uh, vulnerable and near threatened um, uh, in the UK as well. So when we did the, uh, the comparison of species richness for bats across these three stand types we found that um, irregular was doing very well and um, had the highest species richness um, compared to coppice and limited and, and that was statistically significantly so for the um, uh, when compared with coppice. Um, so six of nine bats, which we were able to undertake for um, further analysis, had their greatest occupancy in irregular compared with at least one other stand type. I mentioned the Barbastel and its greatest occupancy in irregular. When I talk about occupancy, I should have mentioned um, we used um, the number of 10 minute periods across a night when a bat, when a bat species was active at a plot. So that was our metric and we we had overall activity and we had uh, uh, activity in these um, uh, partitioned segments of each 10 minute period. And that gives an, an indication of intensity of use throughout the night. 
Um, so it's very pleasing to find that bats like Western Barbastel were spending a good proportion of their time in the irregular stands uh, compared with um, with the others. And um, as we found with serotine, dorbentons, long-eared brants, whiskered and common pipistrelle. Um, you may notice that brants and whiskered were lumped together, and that's because acoustically they're very difficult to, to distinguish, and the same for long-eared bats. Um, in Dorset, um, we get um, all 17 species of bats, including grey long-eared, although um, and they do use woodland as well. But again, the, we weren't able to um, separate out their acoustics. So we, we assume that they uh, it was brown long-eared bats, um, but we just class them as long-eared bats. Um, limited intervention had uh, the most activity from uh, Anatera's bats, which is a, one of these species. It's one of the myotis bats which really flies very slow, but can turn on a sixpence in midair and is a gleaning species, a bit like the long-eared bats. Um, and is that clearly able to deal with all the clutter in, in that stand type where there's a lot of um, st high stem density. Nevertheless, in coppice, um, coppice were, which was very, very dense, um, there were four sample plots where we didn't record any bats at all and I think that was uh, an index indication of just how dense that coppice was some of that coppice would also was also characterized by bramble growing up through it and I wonder whether they were just avoiding the risk of getting snarled up in it that's just a just a theory mm -hmm. but generally speaking most bats are associated with a more open canopy lower basal area and reduced densities of understory although I would say that understory is really important um, because, of course, it's generating a lot of biomass and no, no doubt a lot of invertebrate prey. So, you know, flies, diptera, lepidoptera and so on. Uh, and also association with larger girth trees and the presence of, of deadwood snags. Finally, on to woodland plants. Um, they were sampled in the in the 20 metre quadrats, which I showed you earlier on the plots. Uh, and we've decided um, from discussion with them. Um, with uh, Brian Edwards in the Environmental Records Centre, we thought we'd choose um, Oliver Rackham's coppice associated groups. And they're these phytosociological groups, which we use to show how each, uh, each group responds to certain conditions that um, he came up with. Um, so for spring plants, there are species like pignut and yellow archangel, which are um, flower early in the year and have usually set seed by midsummer. Summer plants, which are very shade resistant, um, so species like wood sorrel and, and dog violet, but they, but they can grow actively even under full canopy. The buried seed plants, um, remember I talked about bramble earlier, uh, and that is one of the species which is a buried mm -hmm. seed plant, given the opportunity when that canopy opens. And you see on the left hand side, we've got some wood spurge uh, in the photo shown there that's responded from a, a recent um, uh, canopy opening that's in a coppice plot. But the same same thing happens in some of the irregular stands as well. Uh, and then there's the mobile plants, which are species which are generally outside of, of the, um, the woodland, but come in or they're moving around the woodland. They're the, the thistle down species, so um, marsh thistle and, and burdock. And then non-responsive plants um, that um, Rackham categorised. Um, these are species which can tolerate very dense shade and they don't really respond to canopy openings or they and they may uh, decline with increasing light so where you create permanent openings these species are likely to diminish so again we did our pairwise comparisons for for these species and um, you can see we had all vascular plants as well as ancient woodland indicators plus the five um, rackham um, coppice group plants that uh, that i've just talked about um, so very, very briefly, I will just say that um, what was really interesting is that for coppice in irregular, there was barely any any difference at all, certainly no significant difference. The 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 stand type with the um, which um, showed up the poorest was certainly the limited intervention. So the closed canopy, the simplified structure stands there, um, closed canopy, poor um, light. Um, didn't do very well, and some of that was statistically significantly so. Um, okay, this is probably the last um, one of the last slides. It's um, just showing the um, results of some just three examples of what we did was a, a, an indicator species analysis, and this just shows 
the frequency of a species and its relative abundance in a plot um, to produce an indicator species value. Um, so the closer it got to 100 percent, the, the, the more likely it was to be an indicator of a particular stand management type. Mm -hmm. Some were likely to be uh, just for one stand management type and others could be uh, for, for two. Actually, the analysis works for more than more than one stand type. So you can see some examples there with um, a yellow archangel uh, in coppice, uh, which was also found. Uh, in irregular, which is in the middle photograph on the left hand side. Um, and in, indeed, um, Moschatel was just uh, comes out as a strong indicator of irregular and neither of the other stands. Uh, and then down at the bottom, you've got the um, uh, Ramsons, uh, Allium asylum, which is uh, one of the non response uh, um, plants. And again, that's um, found in equal measure as an indicator species in both irregular and in limited intervention. So overall conclusions for all of the study are that the structural heterogeneity created in, in, the, in the irregular stands provided a wide range of, of habitat resources from early successional woody species through to the later growth stages, including mature trees and deadwood characteristics. Um, supported coppice associated ancient wood and ancient woodland plants with some of the highest bat species, which had the highest bat species richness and some high abundances of several woodland specialist birds. Um, I just caveat all of this by saying that no single silvicultural system can meet all the requirements of every species, but certainly pro providing you know this dynamic range of, of structures can help maintain some of the habitat resources for many of the species. Um, and, but each site could could well have its own particular nuances and, and con species of conservation interests that require targeted action. Um, but certainly this study has shown that active management is preferable to limited intervention um, for retaining species of conservation interest. Um, and there's my acknowledgements and that's um, that's my presentation so i'm happy to um answer any questions i appreciate that it was a bit of a whiz through and um uh, as i say there is a um an opportunity if you take the quarterly journal of forestry to um um have a read through that as well but i'm also ha happy for you to um get in touch um via email if you've got any other questions after this uh, has finished okay thanks All right um, thank you, Danny. That, um, yeah, as you say, that was a, a whistle-stop tour. That you really um, took us through a, an awful lot of things there. So a lot of really interesting detail. Um, uh, and so, yes, you've delivered a, a huge amount of information there in a very short time. Thank, thank you for that. That was yeah. that was really. Fantastic. You're welcome. Um, yeah, um, yeah. There, there are a few things that 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 um, um, you know I have picked up on. You know. Uh, structural heterogeneity is important for biodiversity variety and active management is is one of the the, the tools really for, for for producing this um and um you know we're we're talking about all sorts of things at the moment um you know there's there's a there's a very keen interest in net biodiversity gain um that we're hearing about and how do we monetize benefits such as the ones you've described um, it's an incredibly you know rich woodland type that you've been describing there mm -hmm. um, and yet there's a relatively modest amount of, of, of timber production from these areas but um, um, uh, Andy Andy Paul might disagree with me on that um, but um, uh, it, it's very interesting to see what what it is that you're coming up you've got this evidence to show that, active management actually produces a lot of benefits and um you know another thing that i found very interesting was is that you were talking about the um the indicator species that might be associated with the different forest types mm. and could these be surrogates for identifying uh, a certain level of biodiversity or um net biodiversity gain 
That's a really good question, Phil. Um, it's it's actually something we in the um, I think probably the slide which I showed early on in the presentation. We are looking at um, we're including moths as well and looking at how moths as a group um, uh, correlate or looking at congruence across these different taxonomic groups. I, I can't answer the, the question specifically as much as I'd like to, but I think um, trying to find some species which certainly indicate um, conditions which um, could act as a surrogate is would be a really nice thing to, to find. I actually wonder whether we should be turning it around the other way and looking at um, uh, structural measures that could be delivered and then considering um, how much of a certain structural attribute you can you can incorporate into your forest management methodology um, and finding whether whether that has uh, a biodiversity marker against it that, that would be useful for you for you guys, particularly yes. responsible for managing these woods. I think that's something that um, would be good to good to do a bit more work on, actually. And um, we are looking at, um, at a congruence analysis now. So is it going to be an indicator species or is it going to be structural attributes? You know, I certainly think that from looking at the irregular stands, it has what I call a very wide ecological bandwidth there mm. of, of habitat characteristics. So for some of those species, they're at lower densities, perhaps, than they may be in coppice. But nonetheless, they're important, still providing important habitat for some of those early successional species, as yeah. well as some of the old growth characteristics. And that's uh, getting the best of both worlds. But perhaps to, for it to be more meaningful, we need to do a bit more work mm -hmm. and um, scale up the irregular silver culture. <laughs> Yes, you know, thanks for that. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I took your point there that there is no uh, management system that does everything for everything and that, you know, you're always going to have the specialists and, you know, this is why we need this range of forest types. Yeah. But yeah, in general, yes, we need to be doing more irregular forestry. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I agree with that. Um, I better have a look at the um, at some of the questions that have come up here, Danny. Um, so I'll just read some of these things out for you. Um, yeah, um, have you, um, is coppice counted within the understory density? This is from Alex. Yeah, so so understory density was measured in all of the stand, stand management types and then comparisons made across. So yes, it was. Um, it was it was greatest in, uh, uh, so I, I mentioned there were there were two height bands that we measured. In fact, there were three. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those I didn't go into much detail because I had to get through a lot. But um, so my apologies for that if I skimped over it. But um, uh, understory density in coppice was highest at two meters, um, uh, followed by um, uh, in irregular. So that that's a sort of a signifier of the of the the stage at which that coppice was was at. There was more in the coppice at two meter high understory density. Um, than, than there was in any other stand management type and limited intervention was was there was just no understory at all really hmm. all right okay yeah interesting yeah um so another question here this is from ian hannah um while the formal research took place in ancient woodland would you extrapolate any of the findings to pores or other woodland types was it really all ancient woodland y yeah Including we we focus we focus primarily on the semi-natural stands, mm, most yeah. of which is actually triple SI as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so so Andy's got um you know got a juggling act with trying to generate some some mm. revenue from it as well as meeting with the you know the favourable condition status for natural England as well and um and so far seems to be doing a pretty good job of that. Um, whether we could extrapolate it to other um, management types. I think I'd be very careful about saying that. But what I will say is that um, I've been involved with um, butterfly conservation through Patrick Cook um, at um, Starhead Western Estate, which is again within the Cranbourne Chase National Landscape, uh, which is predominantly conifer. Um, so Douglas fir and um, Sitka and um, Norway spruce, which of course David Pengelly and Nick Hoare work mm. together. On. Yeah. Um, and we've got some very promising results there. We've actually, um, Patrick has actually um, 
published a paper which I was involved with on bats and, and that's available in forest ecology and management. And I think at some point it'd be good to get Patrick to come and give you a talk about those mm -hmm. results. He's also um, through just working his way through a, a, another paper on moths in irregular silviculture in that, those conifer blocks. So um, it looks promising, um, but I think it's a, it's a, you know, each woodland has its own unique ecological signature and historical signature, as I'm sure most of you are very familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, so that sort of nuance, you have to be careful about extrapolating too much. Mm -hmm. But I definitely think in broadleaf semi-natural woodlands and broadleaf woodland, all this new woodland that we're creating, somewhere down the line, we need to think carefully about how we're going to create those the wide range of that ecological bandwidth that we need for species of conservation interest, as well as meeting with all the other ecosystem services that you guys are expecting to be delivered, you know. Yes, that's right. You know, you're absolutely right. You don't just stick trees in the ground and stand back. You know, you need to wait a little while for them to, to establish, but you then need to think about how you're going to actually change that structure, how you're going to break that even age mold and move into something else. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and also thank thanks for that recommendation for from Pat about Patrick. Yeah, we must we must follow that up uh, yeah. and see if he can, uh, um, you know, be one of our guest speakers. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah I have warned him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th yeah, thanks, Danny. Um, right. Um, what else do I have here? Did you ever observe any difference in implied bird territory size? Could plots with less intervention, offering maybe a richer habitat, support a greater density of territories for individual bird species. Right, okay. If we were going to have done territory mapping, then we would have been able to to, to do that, if we, but that's a different sort of methodology because yeah. this is plot-based sampling and timed point counts. All we were able to do is just, it, it, but it's still very useful, is to generate density estimates. So the, the, the density, the mm -hmm. numbers of birds within a given unit area. Um, and certainly for some of those species like the marsh tit, I mean, there are 122 birds per square kilometre within a kilometre of, square kilometre of irregular high forest. And that's a lot, you know, and that's that's up there when if you look at the um, the last breeding bird atlas for the UK and Ireland, um, that's at the at the upper level of that for that species, you know, so that's that that's, um, you know, that's really, really quite, quite useful. So I take the point. Yes, you could look at um, um, sort of area density measures, but we kind of done that through the plot based system but territory mapping is another very useful way of, of um, looking at that as well yeah yeah different tool but different. Uh, yeah but you've come up with a very interesting result yeah um yeah this is maybe a bit of a nerdy question question what program did you use to establish bird densities from distance sampling was it welcome distance sampling dot org uh, no it's actually called distance Right. And you, you mentioned that. Yes. Yeah, it's actually called distance. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a few yes. years ago since I've, I've used it, but um, yeah. um, it's I think it's a free download, actually. And I'm right. trying to I think it might be from St. Andrews University. So, you know, if you use a um, search engine like Google, um, I'm sure you'd be able to find it. And it was it was freebie, you know, I mean, it, it was very good, actually. I hasten to add it was very good. There was as long as you input the data, which has to go in as a CSV file, um, you know, and yeah. you, you, it, with anything like this, with new, new software, that, or certainly to me anyway, uh, probably because of my level of incompetence, um, uh, it, you, you get it wrong, you get it wrong, and then eventually you get it right. You know, so you have to try these things a few times before. Yes. Really. <laughs> great okay thanks for that um and so yeah ian is also asking at what in, at what intervals were the coppice areas cut and was the coppice cut with hand tools chainsaw or mechanized um was um, that part of the study no not really no, no. Not i really. think um i think it depends on the um i can i can answer some of that because mm -hmm. There were there are two main hurdle. Well, there's 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 Don who was the hurdle maker, and then there is the um, 
and then there's another guy called Andy Taylor who does a lot of the work on the birch. And I think the birch he actually coppices because it's only on a very short rotation using a, a, um, a high power brush cutter. Mm. Um, and for anything that's bigger, it would be done with a chainsaw, um, possibly for the, some of the hazel with a with a bill hook. Mm -hmm. um if it's on if it's on the smaller diameter size mm -hmm. but um anything which is um on the larger size is going to be um you know changed yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. okay um right um yeah was there any investigation of the seed bank because you did mention bramble being one of these long leaf seeds across the different plots and would there be any reason to expect any difference in the dormant seed bank available to be triggered by a chance light availability, for example? Mm. Yeah, I mean, we didn't we didn't actually go rummaging around looking looking at for seeds per se. Yeah. Um, but um, I I I think that where ground is more disturbed, and that's one of the I think if you're using bigger machinery, you are probably more likely to get a response from some of these buried speed seed species. Um, well, I didn't mention it, but what we did find was that um, in, in the irregular plots, we were finding things like um, uh, gallium aparine, which, um, uh, you know, sticky weed uh, or cleavers. Um, that was, was more commonly associated with the irregular stand type so i think that these species may well be in within the, the seed bank already just because yeah. of the configuration of the uh, of the land you know it's a it's a um it's within a farmland setting although these are big big blocks of woodland and it was one of the advantages of doing this study is that we could make these comparisons there are very few areas of woodland in this part of the world where we had that sort of scale of, of woods so i suspect that if you disturb the soil um, in any of the other um, stand types, you would have got a similar response. Um, but it's it's just something that we we highlighted there. But it, it wasn't necessarily negatively or competitively affecting any of the other ancient woodland plants in regular, I hasten to add. Okay, yeah. Okay, thanks for that. That's very interesting, yeah. Um, yes, uh, what is the estimated age of the limited stand yeah, and how would you rate its structure relative to a healthy old growth ecosystem? Um, sorry, what was the last bit of that question? Yeah, that's right. How would you rate its structure relative yeah. to a healthy old growth? Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. Well, I have some experience of of looking at old growth woodlands in Hungary, actually, and I went there years ago on a on a Churchill travel fellowship. Yeah. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's quite different, really, because, you know, I and I know that um, from studies that have been done in the UK in Lady Park Wood by George Peterkin uh, and others, uh, that, you know, it's, it's still quite a homogenized structure. And it's only where you get big tree fall gaps that, uh, as a result of you know storms or lightning strikes that kind of thing that you start to see some of this restructuring take place i think the limited intervention stands here are the result of a cessation of management at the earlier part of the 20th century up to probably 1960s um, mm -hmm. some of it would have been worked but very light touch maybe a bit of firewood um, perhaps up to sort of 30 years ago and thereafter, not, not a lot has happened since. So you've got a lot of even age stuff all vi vying for the light and then falling apart. Some of it yes. di dying off, you know. So mm. it's, quite, it's quite different from some of those really old growth. And it certainly mm. doesn't bear any resemblance to sort of pasture mm. woodland at all, really, you know. So um, mm. it's got some way to go before it restructures naturally or, or, or on its own. No, I, I, I would agree with that. I think we don't have these examples um, or we don't have very many of these examples in this country. And uh, you're quite right. You know, you need to go elsewhere to see what this actually looks like. You know, mm -hmm. something that's been you know, evolving over several hundred years. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, I think uh, in the uh, UK forestry standard, there is a 
there is scope for leaving sort of non-intervention areas in in uh, in the standard and and that's good i mean we, we we need those things to see how 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 they act in especially as the climate is changing to see how leaving mm. a few things alone uh, responds as a bit of a control really so um yeah. um but i'm i'm certainly you know i was certainly quite quite um I'm so impressed by what I found in the irregular stands. It was, you know, a mixture of a bit of old growth and early succession. And that's uh, almost the best of both worlds, really. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Somebody's asking uh, about whether the recordings are available. Yes, they are. So that um, if you've missed anything, um, yeah, uh, you can all go back and, 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 um, uh, Polly has been taking a recording, and you'll be able to to to, to you know, go back over detail if you need to. Right, comment for those of us involved with woodland creation. VNG is a concept very important to support. E.g., FC's operations note forty three and LSE. Uh, likely significant effect under EIA forestry opinion, but as yet there is no accepted metric to evaluate this. Do not confuse with any's BNG metric that is about town and country planning at land concession conversion. Mm. Um, yeah, well, that's that's not my area of expertise. Yeah. I know more about planning than. Um, yeah than 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 uh, forestry because that's what i i worked in when i worked in local government but um it's not the reason we undertook this study put it that way was to make a comparison mm. but obviously um under the wildlife and countryside act because it's a triple si word obviously andy is under certain you know management obligations to to maintain the um the features for which the site is designated and i think we've pretty much managed to demonstrate that we've we've we're able to do that using this irregular mm. met methodology but um yeah that's a bit, what, bit sort of out of the scope of of what my talk yeah. is about really sure 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 yeah yeah and Ma matthew matthew says in another comment my understanding of what uh is that the woodland wildlife toolkit the sil silver woodland condition assessment uh and associated app will be used to identify biodiversity values of woodlands uh, for BNG and uh, incentives. The markers and triggers within this assessment, while simple, seem to align with Danny's findings around the irregular, which is comforting. Great resource. Okay. Oh, that's good. Well, that's good. Thank you, Matthew. That's yes. good. <laughs> it's great. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. How are we doing for time? Yeah, we've got a few more minutes. Um, yeah, um, Andy Davis asks, have you looked at importance of patch size within these blocks? It would be useful to know for forest management how much irregular management would be needed in the landscape to benefit wider biodiversity. Yeah, I think um, I think the simple answer is no, we haven't looked at, at patch mm -hmm. size, but I mean, minimum area metrics for species vary depending on the species that you're looking at and obviously if you're looking at plants you don't need such a a big area but because they tend to just sit around but for for mobile species you need to be able to allow species to permit you know the landscape yeah. to be more perme permeable um and as i say we we didn't look really at that level we this was really about looking at the stand level characteristics because we wanted it to be useful for foresters yeah um i think i think as i mentioned in at the end of the presentation you know there's no single stand management type which will provide all of the resources for all of the species and when you pull away from a um uh out, the further out you go on a map and you see different types of, of silviculture management at a landscape scale, uh, things become more interesting because you're then providing conditions for a wider range of species. It's it's how that landscape is configured, which is why there's a lot of work going on about um, landscape recovery at the moment and, and joining things up very much going back to the Lawton Review back in 2010 about bigger, better, more joined up uh, functioning land, landscapes. Um, 
I, so I, I don't really have an answer to sort of patch, minimum patch area, but I do think we need we need more woodland, um, perhaps 30 percent. I don't know. I, I've heard that bigger. I went to a talk yeah. Um, yeah. by Gabriel Hemery um, in Shaftesbury just before Christmas, and he talks about about yeah. that and other people who are foresters mentioned yeah. that sort of figure, which aligns with a lot of the you know what we're talking about for biodiversity conservation. So um, yeah. it'd be interesting to know what people think about that, really. Yeah, well, that's right. It's interesting, you know, to set that that percentage increase in woodland cover against. Uh, the ten percent that Welsh government have been asking farmers to to find on their farms, yeah, you know, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what you know where 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 that, that how that works out. Um, yeah, Ian again asks uh, within the irregular intervention plots, was the soil disturbance that triggered seed germination attributable to mechanized felling and extraction? Uh, were any of those plots extracted by horse? And would that give any insight to whether compaction might be less with some with the same benefits of soil disturbance? Yeah. Um, I don't think Andy has used um, horses in Rushmore. I don't know. I don't you might so. know no, no, better, no. Than, better than me. I think it's probably yeah. all done. I mean, I know that care is taken with extraction racks, um, putting brushwood down to try and minimise that. Mm. Um but um, I think um, it's a, it's inevitable when you're driving a forwarder through a forest, there will be a certain amount of mm -hmm. disturbance, mm -hmm. but you minimise that by 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 the design. I so say it wasn't a it wasn't a major issue, and it wasn't a, yeah. it certainly wasn't signifying any com com competition there for the ancient woodland plants. They were just as prevalent in the regular plot the regular plots uh, as, as they were in the coppice, which is obviously managed in a in a lighter lighter touch yeah. um, i think had there been though we may well have, have you know found something a bit a bit different it was just a one or two species which were found in the irregular plots that were more common there than in any of the other stand management types and that possibly is because a tractor went through at a certain time mm -hmm. that's all i can say about that yeah. really because it wasn't there yeah. for the felling operations i'm afraid yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I I know that Andy's very very careful about that about how he designs his his extraction routes and these sort of things and uh, and particularly in the type of woodland in 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 ancient woodland types, it's really quite difficult to find permanent racks. Yeah. So he goes to the trouble of marking these in you know he has color coding so that you know a blue a blue mark is indicating a permanent rack. Yeah. So the machinery is actually restricted to these areas and they're under strict instructions only to travel there and that concentrates the brash mats and these sort of things so that mitigates some of the compaction uh, yeah. effects but it limits it to these very very specific areas that the machines yeah. aren't allowed to go rambling around disturbing regeneration or compacting the soil yes yeah yeah, yeah. that's right yes yeah okay, okay. Good, good. Well, so we've had some very good questions. Um, um, oh, there's another one popping in here. Yeah, we're nearly finished now, so maybe um, uh, this might be our last question. Um, right, yes, this is just, yeah, this is a, a interesting. Just to follow up on the old growth question, it seems to me that CCF has the potential to move a managed forest towards an old growth structure. Given our biodiversity data on limited stands, the data seems to suggest the limited stands uh, are, a, are a mature, even aged ecosystem. The structural data like number of stems seems to support even age mat mature uh, for the limited stands and the irregular stands seem to suggest a gr aggressive biomass removal. I'm concerned about your data. I'm concerned your data supports a common narrative of early successional habitats support the greatest biodiversity. Um, I don't think that's true, actually. No, I wouldn't agree with that. But um, I think what it what it supports, certainly from the um, woodland birds in in the UK, and particularly most of the of the yeah. species of conservation concern, not all of them. Are the early successional species, and that's because we, you know, historically have a tradition of coppicing in this particular study area. Um, so there would have been a lot more early successional habitat yeah. in this study site. 
Um, in other areas, it, it's going to be different. Um, and I think this is where we get into the nuances, really. Um, I, I think that the old growth characteristics and, and you know, what I would like to do, I'd like to go back again and do the, it would be great to go and do the whole study again and see whether these results stand up 10 years, nearly 10 years as we are down the line, but also look at, consider other species, um, species which are perhaps old growth characteristic species, some of these saproxylic beetles, for example, um, it would be quite interesting to do studies on that and indeed fungi as well. I mean, that's a very much in vogue at the moment, um, mycorrhiza and, and, you know, all of the um, plants that we know live in woodlands have a, a endophytic, you know, mutual relationship with um, with mycorrhiza. So uh, I take the point, but um, I, th I don't, you know, we weren't trying to look just for the um, results affecting um uh, early successional species i think the old growth species are, are important too and particularly the bats as well and bats like barbastel require you know densities of um you know snags um lifting bark so where you've retained those old growth characteristics i think that's um you know i think that's really um really important that that, that yeah. uh, that's recognized in in the stand management yeah, sure. And, and I think, well, you know, this is this goes to the core of pro silver forestry, really, that they want, you know, pro silver aims to integrate all these different um, stag, you know, within within an irregular stand, you have all sorts of different aspects, there, early successional, uh, you yeah. have all the understory and but also you have, you know, retaining standing deadwood with snags. And yeah. it's that continuity. That, that provides the benefit that the, the, the you know that, that provides the opportunities for the fungal yes. complexities and the insects to yes. develop. But yes. you know there needs to be clear objective management that you know that, that you retain these things. So you retain yes. the, old, the old growth characteristics or you retain um the, the standing deadwood of, of of large size trees. Yes. Um, and and um so you can incorporate all these things, but it's a matter of choice, and it's something that you have to manage for. Absolutely, yeah, I I couldn't I couldn't agree more, and that's down to each forest manager and their decisions based on the particular site type that they 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 have under their control. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, right, okay, okay, Danny, well. I think um, yes, we've just we're just over the the hour now. Okay. Um, so um, uh, Polly has um, said that we can go over by a few minutes, but I think you know we could go on and on because <laughs> it's been a really fascinating uh, yeah. hour, and, and um, I'm very grateful for you know for your presentation. There's an awful lot of information there. People were asking, um, can they go back to it? Yes, I reassure everyone that you know this is something that's going to be uh, online, and that if People want to go over some of the detail because there's a lot of information that you you rattled through there that was very very good um there's all that detail there that we can all go back to and 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 look at that look at it more carefully yeah so, absolutely thank you very very much okay you're welcome thanks very much and thanks everybody for listening in great cheers thank okay thanks thank you goodbye